I became involved with the um, DMT study that uh, Rick Strassman carried out. We both um, were invited to attend a conference uh, on the West Coast at a little resort in, in, the, in the fall of 1984. And Rick and I were um, talking. I, I hadn't met him, but I knew of his paper where he would written a review on the adverse uh, consequences of um, hallucinogens. And we were uh, probably two of the legitimate, let me say legitimate uh, scientists or clinicians who were there. There were a lot of sort of people who were involved in the counterculture and so forth, but Rick and I were in, had academic appointments and were considered ourselves serious scientists. And Rick and I had uh, several discussions at that meeting about the fact that no one was doing clinical research in this field. And I think both of us had the opinion that it was because there were no qualified people, that uh, if qualified clinicians did it, it was possible. And there were a lot of people at that meeting who were sort of naysayers, and they said, oh, the government will never let you do this, the government will never let you do this. But I was of the strong opinion uh, that you could do these studies, and, and Rick agreed, and I encouraged him, and I, I thought, you're in an academic position, you'd be the perfect person to do it. So we had a number of discussions, and uh, including discussions with Danny Friedman, who was one of the big pioneers who had done a lot of the early clinical work with uh, LSD in humans. And Danny was very encouraging. He felt like the time was right, and he particularly felt like Rick was the right guy in the right position and had the infrastructure. Really encouraged Rick and, and was sort of a mentor. Uh, I had discussions with him, too. He encouraged me to support Rick as well. And <clears throat> as the process went along, of course, Rick was doing all the uh, heavy lifting and doing the paperwork and uh, designing the protocol and the, all the instruments to assess the psychological effects and so forth and so on. But, at some point, the discussion came up, you know, Dave, what if I do all this paperwork and spend all this time and get to the end of things and I'm ready to go and I can't get the DMT? And that was a real possibility because the DMT, clinical grade DMT, wasn't a chemical you could just buy off the shelf somewhere. You couldn't just order it. Nobody wanted to deal with it because not only did it have to be pure, but you had to have a whole profile of paperwork to the FDA documenting how it was made and who made it and the purity and so forth and so on. And I told Rick, if you get to that point and no one will make it, then I'll do it. And ultimately, Rick got to that point, and I made it. Um, I had made one previous drug for clinical trials, so I had a little experience. And I basically worked with the FDA chemist. We just had to make sure it was ultra pure. We had a lot of benchmarks and milestones we had to meet, and we got there. We got it certified by the FDA and then transferred it over to his study. I was really gratified that that study could go forward because it was the first time, uh, really, in 20 or so years that anyone had done a clinical study. And it was really, I mean, it was exciting for me because I thought this is the first time. And I think Rick, even one of his papers, even said something about this, the, the first study in a generation. It was really true. This was the first study in a generation. And not only that, despite the fact that DMT had been used safely in earlier studies and it was this natural component of the brain, DMT is one of the most profound and potent psychedelics known. So it wasn't just an initiation of clinical research, it was a reinitiation of clinical research with an extremely potent drug that had a long history of study and could really tell us some things. So I was really happy to be part of that and be able to facilitate that study going and, and make the DMT.